my folks, kill the man here, with whiskey. Whiskey, big hair, and a smile upon my gorehound's face. Cheers, y'all. Mm. Now we're going to carry on with our little Lucio Fulci festival of fright and ferocity. So we've already looked at City of the Living Dead, and this is the direct follow-on to that, uh, The Beyond, which came out in 1981. A very, very busy, productive year for little Lucio Fulci was 81, because he had this, he had The Black Cat, and he had The House by the Cemetery. All of which um, only furthered his, you know, his canon of, you know, quite what had become classic, you know, cult movies, genre masterpieces, to people with a certain, maybe, jaded palate, maybe. Uh, now, he was incurring the wrath of censorship around the world, of course. He was not exactly, you know, the, the flavour of the month with critics, but fans were beginning to lap up, you know, his particular brand of spaghetti splatter. His bugaboo dubbing, his crazy international casts, his warped, non-linear storytelling, his crazy zooms and his penchant for maggots and horrific stomach-churning effects were gaining, you know, a fair bit of gusto. Now, City of Living Dead was the first of his Apocalypse trilogy, which was centred around haunted dwellings, really, and, you know, books of, you know, arcane witchcraft and occult devilry, and opening portals to hell and beyond, hence the title of this one, The Beyond. And this particular movie, many of his fans hail this as his, his masterpiece, his real best work. I would still air on Zombie Flesh Eaters for lots of personal reasons and lots of nostalgia, but I just love that one a bit more. This, the more I watch it, the more impressed with it I get, and I've seen it a hell of a lot. And 1981's The Beyond centres around a Louisiana hotel, which um, the lovely Catriona McCall, last seen in City of Living Dead, who's looking even more attractive in this film, uh, plays this English heiress who's inherited this, this hotel, which we've seen in a marvellously photographed sepia-tinted prologue, is the domain of a warlock who's been reading from the book of um, Ibon, or Ebon, in the previous film, it was the Book of Enoch. <laughs> and he's got this marvellous painting of what looks like a hellish wasteland populated only by desiccated corpses all across this hellish barren terrain. And in this sepia tinted prologue, a bit of a throwback to the old Universal Horrors and the Hammer Horrors, we have lots of torch wielding villagers and townsfolk on the warpath. Oh, he's in there, he's in that hotel, and he's in the infamous room 36. So they go in there and these guys exact their revenge upon the warlock who's apparently you've cursed our town forever, you know, now you're going to face our wrath. And, and this poor bastard gets chain whipped. He then gets beaten and dragged down into the cellar of the hotel. He gets nailed up to the wall, you know, crucified. And then they're going to put this horrible acid type substance on his face and melt him down as well. Jesus Christ, what has this guy done? It kind of makes the poor, you know, the poor sex deviant in, you know, City Living Dead who gets his head rammed onto a lathe. You know, that's that's kind of a, kind of kind, really, compared to what this guy goes through. So many years later, you know, the lovely Katrina McCall as Liza has inherited the place and she's trying to refurbish it and do it all up. Unbeknownst to her, of course, that the curse is genuinely true and... This is based over one of the Seven Gates of Hell, which I think was a, wasn't that the American title? Or oh, Seven Doors of Hell, something like that anyway. And again, like Fulci's full, 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 full playing on this sort of supernatural, gothic, almost Lovecraftian um, sense of an arcane world, a land beyond, a warlock or somebody sinister dabbling in the occult and opening up this portal. In which case, you know, the undead will once again rise to do this was Warlock's bidding, and quite what the end result's meant to be. Fuck knows. Basically, the zombies in this just tend to kind of drive people into the beyond, which is this nether, nether world of the, the abyss, you know? But this is a great, great movie. Not only do you have zombies, not only do you have this supernatural craziness, you have absolutely fantastic photography. 
He's on location again. He's filming a lot of this in Louisiana. Some of it in, actually in New Orleans as well. No New York shots in this one. And his photography is even better. His direction is even better. It's more fluid. It's sharper. It's more, you know, atmospheric. His maze on scene, his build-up is far more deliberate, far more calculated. The plumber turns up at the air, at the, the hotel. Joe the plumber. And Liza says, you know, I've been here for a few weeks now and no water comes out the faucet. He goes, well, let's take a look then. And uh, oh, the basement is flooded. The basement, oh my God, this, this thing is huge. This labyrinthine, it's almost like a, a catacomb underneath the hotel. And yeah, it's flooded. There's a little sort of walkway when he goes through. Now this is the guy that's gonna bash through the wall to find out where's this water leaking from? And he's gonna find, you know, oh, walled up behind is of course the wall lock. He goes missing. Well, does he? We've seen what happens to him. Uh, and it's a particularly nasty eye gouging. One of several eye gougings in this film. That becomes a bit of a pension for Fulci in this particular movie. And uh, <laughs> he's the start of many corpses which will then be revived and come back again. And including the Warlock's corpse as well, which is, you know, so over a couple of centuries old now. <laughs> and uh, a bloody mess. But that doesn't stop um, Al Cliver. Not his real name. I forget his Italian name, but Al Cliver, who played Brian in Zombie Flesh Eaters, and will be seen again in The Black Cat, the same year as The Beyond. He plays this doctor working for the hero of the film, David Warbeck. And you see him putting electrodes in the morgue, this very sort of sci-fi looking morgue with these cadavers all over the place. And he puts electrodes on his bloody head, its disheveled molten head, and he's got a little like brainwave machine. Why? <laughs> Fucking things long, long dead, for God's sake. Maybe he knows something that we, as the audience, seem to know that this thing. Boo, boo, he walks out the room. Boo, boop, 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 brainwaves. Yes, this thing's alive. But who cares? There's no, there's no scientific explanation for any of this. Of course there isn't. You have the book of Ebon. And this book seems to magically teleport itself around the bloody film. It'll arrive in different locations. It'll even be in a library. And Liza, who's learning more about the, the background of this hotel, and she's met this blind um, sort of seer, a blind psychic seer, with her fantastic German shepherd guide dog. Um, and I forget the girl's name. <laughs> but she meets her a couple of times, and she's like saying, look, Liza, you need to get out of the hotel. Leave now. Go back. Go back to where you came from. And, you know, Liza's like, yeah, whatevs, you know. But this book of Ibon keeps cropping up and she starts to read, or, or tries to, because the book then keeps fucking disappearing and appearing in other places. David Warbeck, the, who's a doctor at the, at the local hospital, who rather handily has a magnum revolver in his drawer at work. And lots of ammunition as well. Not that anyone bats an eyelid that he's got a fucking revolver in his desk. Jesus, this is a hospital, Christ, not a, not a shooting range. Anyone think the place would become a room with zombies? They have to be shot in the head before they go down. Ah. So, yeah, she learns more and more about the history of the place. Weird things happen, not even people disappear and then turn up dead. But, you know, the strange noises paintings appearing to come to life and lots of weird shenanigans in room 36 and Fulci does deliver these supernatural thrills with some panache like there's an old style you know bell system where someone in the room would ring the bell for room service and this bell goes and it's like that ridiculous sort of drill like sound which goes right through you no no one's in the hotel it's deserted and this room 36 keeps going off like and it's quite clever, and it kind of takes on an effect of, uh, in The Shining, you know, room 237, is it? The haunted, the most haunted room in the Overlook Hotel. So, like, each time this thing goes, I'm like, oh, don't go up there, don't go, to, don't go to room 36. And it's quite clever the way he, he, he does these scenes. He builds up a fair degree of suspense. His storytelling this time, it, with a um, screenwriter, uh, Donadeno Sagetti, who would work with him on The Black Cat as well, and The House by the Cemetery, is far more coherent than his usual slew of um, you know, spaghetti splatter. 
where it's just set piece after set piece and it doesn't have to make any sense. This kind of does follow a nice pattern. Liza will meet David Warbeck, the, the doctor. She will meet uh, the blind girl. Various people around her will get offed. Um, her mate who's helping do the place up, he has it. <laughs> he go once the, the Book of ivon has gone missing again, he will go to the library. Don't worry, I'll, I'll chase this up, I'll find it. Whereupon we meet little Lucio Fulci again in his one of his customary trademark cameos. And uh, this guy goes up one of those ladders, you know, finds the book. Oh, flash of light, <sighs> flies off the ladder, boom, hits the deck. Notorious scene coming. We've had maggots, we've had all sorts of insectoid monstrosities in a Fulci, Fulci flick. Now we get tarantulas. Not just real tarantulas, but the dreaded pipe cleaner tarantulas too. So you're going to see, creeping towards him as he's lying there, paralysed on the floor, real tarantulas. And these here, <laughs> rather pathetic, but they're kind of cute and nostalgic. You know, They haven't lost their charm. They're not convincing, but hey, you know, I still wouldn't like them on me. These pipe cleaner ones which kind of move, uh, 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 where the other ones actually have legs that move independently. Uh, so you can kind of tell the real ones from the fake ones. But what do these spiders do, I hear you ask? Well, well, I'll tell you what they do. They, cr they crawl all over this stricken guy. And as tarantulas are known to do, proceed to eat his tongue, tear his lips off, rip through his nose, and tear his fucking eyeball out. Because spiders are known for doing that kind of thing, aren't they? Oh my God, it, it's, it's horrendous. Not helped by the fact that he, he you know, he's, he's, he's paralysed, but you know, his eyes are moving, he's, he's alert and aware of what's happening to him. And these things, that, there's a real actor lying there and you've got real tarantulas crawling all over him and onto his face. And then, and then these things, they, they open his mouth and pull his tongue out and bang through his tongue. Fucking hell, you know, Fulci. What are you thinking, man? What are you thinking? What are you trying to do to us? Need a drink after that. Mm. There is another eyeball bit of you know, mayhem as well. Because back at the hotel, when, when Joe's body, Joe the plumber, remember him? He got his eye plucked out. There's um, the woman that played Mother Tene Tenebratum in Tenebrae at the end, who becomes like this ghastly death face skull thing uh, at the end of, it, of Dario Argento's Inferno. Well, she plays this kind of uh, weird, almost scary housemaid. She doesn't last too long. Looks sinister, but she's not. And uh, she seems to have a weird relationship with Joe the Plumber, because when you first meet, there's one of those... And this film doesn't have many of them, these, these Italian you know, exploitation weird moments. A, a real thing for, for Fulci, of course. Where they're on this little kind of sort of like, you know, bridge across this flooded basement and Lies has tucked him down there. Oh, oh this is a uh, Miss someone so whoever it is, like the maid. And she goes, Oh, Joe. And Joe looks back at her. And the camera just lingers on the, their two faces. And you're thinking, Well, have they got a history together? What's going on here? What? Turns out, nothing. But later in the film, this housemaid will go into. It's room 36 again, isn't it? And she'll find this bath full of uh, this most rancid, horrible sludge you can imagine. And as she reaches in to you know, pull the plug out and it begins to drain. God almighty, there's Joe's corpse. Wasn't that last seen in the morgue? What's it doing here now? And Joe gets up and as she backs away, we see a great big vicious, you know, why would anyone leave a nail, a big, huge, fucking nail that long hanging out the wall and it's 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 right behind their head and he's going uh, in a typical Fulci zombie breathing uh, uh, and he grabs her head and we know what's going to happen <laughs> and this is where like you kind of wish Fulci had a bit of 3D going on because he rams her head onto the onto this nail and this nail goes right through the back of her head right out the eyeball this eye socket and the eyeball goes boom boing like that <laughs> <laughs> it's just great. So I, eyeball mayhem, you, you've got it, plenty of it in this movie. You also have in the morgue, um, Joe's wife and daughter arrive to come and check out the corpse and kind of get him suited for his funeral. And 
this is a really bizarre sequence because the girl sits outside and the mother goes in and tries to you know get him dressed for this you know his final send off and then the girl sits outside and we hear this horrible high pitched scream from within and she runs in and finds her mother lying on the floor beneath an upturned jar of I presume hydrochloric acid which then pours in an extended sequence onto her face so we get another melting sequence with acid you, you know I'm getting your money's worth of the, the gru and the carnage in this movie melts her face down and the sludge the the, the molten sludge of acid then becomes like this sort of pink blancmange demon which creeps across the floor of the morgue and the poor little girl is trying to back away from it going from door to door because this, this kind of morgue's got a lot of doors around it too kind of like something like a, a, like a set from Doctor Who from the 70s each door's locked and then finally she opens one turns around and this zombie leans out again so you got one eye think about eyes in this, moon, this film and it goes, goes and she goes Aah! the next time we see her is at the funeral of her mum and her dad and everyone's saying oh, our condolences good luck to you god bless you and then she'll turn around and she's got a trademark of this movie is the white eyes of the ones who go beyond the ones who become possessed or they, they've gone to the they've gone to this horrendous horrendous hellish limbo land of the beyond their eyes roll over white so she's one of them. Uh, Fulci's treatment of, ch of children. I mentioned in City Living Dead, uh, John John uh, gets terrorised by his sister, his zombified sister, and he has a, bit, a hellish time. In this particular movie, this girl has a hellish time too, and she's a good actress too, as is John John. It's just they're let down by the voiceover acting and the fact that their lips don't match up, and it kind of seems over egged. But they're actually good performers. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're a Fulci fan, you're going to think of, oh, what's his name? Bob in um, House by the Cemetery. That blonde Muppet thing. Holy shit. Now, he's not a bad actor. Let's get that straight. It's just, again, like I said here, it's the guy, it's the person doing the voiceover, which really, really annoys you. So each time he's on screen in House by the Cemetery, you want to throttle this kid. But Fulci puts his kids through really terrible scenarios and... You know, I've got to admire how they handle it. This little girl is superb, I think. And of course, in another notable gory highlight of the film and a very, you know, controversial sequence, we're going to find Liza and David Warbeck's doctor are going to join the extended climax, be running around the hospital, confronted by zombies every which way, and with his magnum, as every surgeon doctor has at his disposal. So it's Blamming, bam, 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 blowing heads, and, you know, this is what gets me as well, you know, he he's five more than six shots in this gun, hey, but that always happens, there is a famous shot as he gets into the escape into an elevator, you see him trying to reload, and David Warbeck didn't have a fucking clue what he was doing, and he's trying to put a bullet, it's a revolver, a bullet down the barrel, and you see him doing it, and you go, oh, no, but hey, you know, this is just one of those quirky little stupid things. Um, but he's worked out. Shoot them in the belly, shoot them in the chest. It doesn't stop him. But he keeps on doing it. The headshot takes him down. The headshot. Come on. But this little girl, at some point, they'll find her and they're trying to rescue her. And then she will turn around at a pivotal moment and go for Liza. With one of those hands. Remember those hands in City of Living Dead that were strong enough to, to break through skulls and tear brains out? Well, maybe he's got one of those superhuman evil hands. And David Warbeck turns around and just goes, whoa, boosh! And the entire front, and in fact half of it, the skull, just goes, whoa! And as she jerks back like that, a huge goblet of brain matter flies out. It's a horrendously gratuitous sequence, but a brilliant effect. And it's also, like, John Carpenter famously shot, is it Kim Hunter, the little girl Kim Hunter, in Assault on Precinct 13. I owe the pistachio. This is regular vanilla. And Frank Doubleday turns round with his mouth and just goes, with a silencer on. And the little girl gets shot dead. And in the 70s, you were like, oh, did you just kill a little girl? No, you didn't, you didn't. Time and sensibilities have moved on, but still, 
Fulci still goes beyond all that. He doesn't give a fuck. He'll kill anyone. Um, what else have we got in this? What else, what else was I going to say about this? Uh, the wonderful uh, Lovecraftian geometry. David Warbeck and Katrina McCall, Liza, are down in the basement of the, uh, the hotel. This hellish blast of supernatural force will drive them back out again. And they're going to go up and find themselves in, you know, the hospital. Then when they escape from the hospital and go down the steps again into what should be the base of the hospital. Oh my God. They're back in the, they're back in the hotel. And then the hotel becomes, beautifully, it becomes that painting, that hellish depiction of this barren, grey, misty landscape. This endless rolling landscape of just rock and barren, you know, corpses littered everywhere which have just decayed and become fossils and of course at the end of the film famously David Warbeck and Trina McCall run in sort of fairy tale slow motion but this landscape goes on forever they turn around it's the same behind them so the hotel is gone the hospital is gone their world is gone they're now trapped in the beyond and as they turn back their eyes roll over white and it's just it's a fabulous you know you know, ah, oh, kick in the chunks sort of finale. It's a great sort of EC comic style finale where, you know, you're never going to win. You were trapped right from the way go. You're never going to survive this one. Um, let's go back to the blind girl. Remember in the film Suspiria, Dario Argento's film Suspiria, the poor blind pianist who incurs the wrath of the, the witch's coven and then they set his dog upon, upon him and his dog tears, his own guy dog tears his throat out. Well, this poor girl, who was tantalisingly, we now realise that she isn't quite human, or still human. She's come back from somewhere. Her house, when Liza goes to the house, it appears elegant and beautifully um, decorated and very nice. But when David Warbeck goes there to try and find his book, it's just a decayed, dishevelled hovel. Hasn't been lived in for many, many years. Cobwebs littered everywhere. There's no sign of life. But we see her go back to the hotel. That's right, go back to her place. She's already said too much about what's going on. And we now know, well, she susses on that there are zombies. Things have entered her house. Her guide dog, sadly called Dickie, which does el elicit a lot of, Dickie, attack! Dickie! Dickie, attack! Kill them, Dickie! Dicky save me, Dicky, Dicky, lots of Dicky, Dicky, Dickies. And this dog is going for all these zombies and it does drive them out. And then in this, like Suspiria, there's a moment of calm and, and lull and tranquility. And then the fucking dog goes for her. And you see far more than what Dario Argento showed you in Suspiria. This thing gives a whopping big, rips the throat out. Very similar to what you saw in Zombie Flesh Eaters with the beautiful Oretta Gay getting her throat torn out, and what you would see in House by the Cemetery, which came out later, the, that the same year as this film. The stringy latex and the gouts of blood. Oh, it, to this day, you know, the throat ripping in a Fulci movie has been unsurpassed. Nothing has gone anywhere near it. But it's just, it's sheer volatile, you know, gusto, and it's endless. It, you, you, Anyone else would cut away? He doesn't cut away. This guy refuses to cut away. He'll show you more than you ever thought possible. And then the dog doesn't stop there. He goes for the side of her head and chews off her ear and half a bloody head comes away. And she's fucking hell. This film really pushed the boundaries of gore effects and just all round nastiness. In this country, the UK, it got banned. Even though almost every scene of gore had been truncated and trimmed here and there, it was it was banned outright. <laughs> um, I had the I had the old Vampix VHS and beat some actual release of it. It was great, but it was cut down. It was great to finally see the fully uncut version. Um, and my God, you know yeah, that that paid dividends. Woohoo! A lot of nastiness. Another gory bit. Poor old um, Al Cliver, who was in Zombie Flesh. Is, uh, and would also be in the Black Cat with David Warbeck. He's he's this useless bloody doctor uh, who's his assist David Warbeck's assistant. A glass window will brilliantly shatter 
the glass will fly inwards and it will skewer his face and he'll stand there against the wall and gouts of blood will spew everywhere what gets me about that sequence is the, the way it's photographed and i've gone about the photographs brilliant the photography is fantastic it is it is but the weird thing about this the window is dead ahead of them explodes al cliver turns like that to the side to shield himself from this shower of glass so does the glass fucking turn like this just go you know is it like you know heat seeking glass is it's smart glass it finds you <laughs> but you know it's still a good effect i, I love it uh, it's you've got to admire fulci's brazen desire to go all out to not only terrify confound and you know astound you he is going to hit you with imagery which you'll never forget he just doesn't give a shit he doesn't care and you've got to, you've got to admire that but as i say this film is very atmospheric far more so than city of the living dead perhaps even more so than zombie flesh because it because it has these supernatural lovecraftian overtones the the elements of darkness and weird ghostly goings on it's got them in spades and you are swept along with this tantalizingly bizarre story which does seem to make sense i will say that the finale the extended finale after all these weird happenings it does just end in a zombie cavalcade it does but by that stage hey you're happy to see the, the shambling undead you know doing their thing and you know <laughs> it does kind of make you wonder how, how many how many dead people did they have in this hospital in this morgue because there's fucking hundreds of them and they've all got various wounds about their faces so it, it, it's just it's a crazy orgy of just you know bloodletting and you know I loved every goddamn minutes of it what else was I going to say about it I'm sure there's plenty more David Warbeck yeah uh, an Australian actor who had been in the fair again he had a name which was people knew his name people knew who he was he'd been in a lot of exploitation films like Christopher George in um, uh, what was it City Living Dead like Ian McCulloch <laughs> who was a British like, TV soap star really uh, in Zombie Flesh Eaters he had a name that people around the world would recognize, potentially recognise and Warbeck's brilliant I, I like him a lot he was in a film called The Last Hunter I think it's got a different name in different territories a Vietnam exploitation and it's it's terrific and you know very very nasty film as well <laughs> some eyeball damage happens in that as well and I think he's great he's also good in The Black Cat but whereas Christopher George in City of the Living Dead is doesn't want to be there well kind of doesn't mind being there because he's just going to take the piss which is almost certainly why his character gets written out without any heroic sort of finale you think he's the hero and he's anything but he doesn't do a fucking thing to be perfectly honest in the film David Warbeck is the champion of this one he's the gung-ho heroic type you know and he is gonna you know fight back and I, I think he I think he's terrific in this you know he's, he's hard bitten he's cynical but when it when the shit hits the fan you know this guy you, you can depend on him he won't ask questions it's just blam fucking blam 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 let's go blam 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 <laughs> You don't take no prisoners, does this guy? So, and Katrina McCall is now she's a lot better in this because again, in City Living Dead, her character, the psychic, doesn't actually do much at all. Once she's there in the town of Dunwich, she and Christopher George are just a device she have had early on to kind of give us a bit of insight into what's going on. And yet, he didn't even need him. The whole thing could have took place in Dunwich Town with the population of Dunwich itself because you don't need these other people in this Catch and McCall is essential to the story David Warbeck is essential to the story and they, and they work well together um, only the version which I just watched again is the uh, which is the Anchor, Anchor Bay not Anchor Bay the Arrow video version which was restored a few years ago another great big box set with posters art cards and, uh, posters over there posters over there somewhere beneath Michael Myers and it it's a good it's a good restoration it, it i like i reviewed it at the time for av forums and i think arrow did fuck up many times and in fact in the version that they put out first for the beyond that brilliantly um, evocative sepia tinted prologue was black and white when they first put it out 
Doom. So they have to get a replacement disc out, and they've done that a few times. They, Zombie Fleshy, just they, they missed a few frames out from the beginning of the the, the ghost ship arriving in Hudson Harbor. So they have to put out another version of that. You know, it's just you know quality control, guys. But they've been a lot better, a lot better ever since, and that is a good version to get older, without a doubt. So there's the Beyond. Uh, it is a, a great movie. Uh, oh, Gianetto De Rosso does the effects for it. Remember me saying in City of Living Dead, there's Gino De, Gino De Rosso and Gianetto De Rosso, or De Rossi, sorry. And one of them is great, one of them isn't so great. And I wasn't sure, sure which one was done that what film, and I couldn't remember. City, City of Living Dead was done by Gino De Rossi, who was not that good. It's Gianetto De Rossi who did Zombie Flesh Eaters, The Living Dead of the Manchester Morgue. He did this, and he did House by the Cemetery. We're there! I finally, finally sussed it. So the effects in this are outstanding. Those throat rippings, eye gouging. Okay, the pipe cleaner spiders. Yeah, they ain't so good. But they're funny, you know. And, and there are fucking real ones there too, so let's not forget that. And, uh, and apparently the, the, the fuckers would run all over the place as well. Like, you know, they move that slowly and creepily. But no, these things can bomb it around like when they want to. Adding to the fear factor of spiders. So guys, there's the Beyond. That's the second in our Fulci Festival. Next up will be the House by the Cemetery. Another haunted house one. And the closing chapter of Fulci's Apocalypse Trilogy. So guys, in the meantime, keep it Celtic. Drink spirits. Mm. Because they're, they're better for you than beer. Apparently. Keep it Celtic. And I'll see you soon. Later.